Lena. It's, it's nice so to meet you. It's so great to meet you. Um, I've been so, I was so lucky to get an early copy of this book and to feel like I was part of the literati for a moment. And I'm just like so thrilled to get to ask you questions about it because I honestly, it's always a pleasure when you get to ask the questions that you've been hoarding in your brain. I am very excited to talk to you too and so excited to read your new book whenever it comes out, which must Thank be soon. You. We hope next, we hope next year, that is what we've been saying, but you and I are lucky enough to have some of like the similar people around us in the, in the random house universe who have, who literally sent this book to me and were like, this was designed to tickle your brain as did your book agent who knows my taste very well. And I wrote him back like a day after I received it saying, basically, I tried to read one chapter and I emerged having read an entire book. It was one of my favorite kind of games, <laughs> just like a day where you stay in bed the entire time and you feel like you're traveling the world. Only this time I just stayed in bed the whole time and felt like I was in someone else's bed. That sounds right. That sounds that, right. That was perfect. I guess the first thing I want to say is it is rare. You know, I'm not young. I'm 36, but I'm not elderly yet. And That's this really was not. the first time that I have read a book where I was like, uh, like there's moments, of course, when I look at TikTok or whatever, but this is the first time I've read a book and thought, I am old. I feel old. I was not old. And I knew Ann Patchett had a similar reaction when she was basically presenting your book on Instagram and blushing and saying, if you want to feel old and read about all kinds of sex, read this book, which I was like, wow, we, Ann Patchett and I are really on the same page right now. And so, you know, what's kind of interesting is that in the book, you talk about the kind of commodification of youth, fetishization of youth, the character even fetishizes her own youth. And so I wonder, you touch on this in the book, do you feel like your being young has come up a lot in promoting and discussing this book and have a lot of people express this idea that they feel like it's encapsulating some kind of generational divide? Yes, some people have. In fact, you know, it's funny, as I've been like talking about the book now that it's been done for a long time, I sort of also feel like old compared to the self that wrote the book in a way. Yeah. And I'm like, oh yeah, like I maybe should have made Eve the narrator who in the book is like 27 or 28. I'm like, maybe I should have made her like 23 or 24. Like maybe that would feel like really like the degree of youth that she has. But I don't know. I mean, at the same time, there's nothing like young inherently about like work about sex right like when yeah. you like you've made so much work that's in large part about sex like did you feel like it was about youth in some way or like I mean it would be different the when the characters get older the sex gets different your characters get older the sex gets different and I have believe me I've got plenty of questions for you about that but I think the thing that for me is that at the time, I didn't understand that I was writing about a kind of sex and a kind of experience that I was only going to have at that moment in my life. And that sort of like yeah. wouldn't age in the way that I thought it would. And also that there was a whole er other era of sex and thinking about sex in front of me. And for me, something that's interesting is those have largely been explorations of monogamy. And so I think something that feels very specific and generational about this mm -hmm is the embrace of this concept of polyamory, which seems to be like one of the great things dividing at least our like liberal nation at the moment. Yeah, totally. And I feel like you meet people at parties and they're like, you know, you know that they're Democrats, but you're waiting to find out if they're polyamorous or not. And <laughs> yes. yes. Like I waiting guess. to find out whether there's like a conservatism in some way or a radicalism to like the private social sphere. Yeah, yeah totally. Great percent. My brother constantly calls me out for being outwardly liberal with like an oddly starkly moralistic streak for somebody who spent so much time naked on TV. And <laughs> what we I love multitudes. About, we contain multitudes. And what I love about this book is like, I love so many things about this book. And I want to start by saying, I think the sex is going to take center stage in so many ways, just because it's designed to make people, I mean, sex is designed to make people feel certain things. But one of the things, the reason I, there's lots of things about sex. The reason I stayed and the reason I consumed the book as quickly as I did is because you write, your prose is just so beautiful and it's not just beautiful, it's unusual. Thank you so much. It's so, like an honor. I want to make the people understand that this isn't just about like, you know, we, we don't have a 50, we don't have a liberal 50 shades of gray on our hands. I, is 50 shades of gray not liberal? I don't know. <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> question. It was, I believe, and I could be wrong that Fifty Shades of Grey was written by like a Mormon housewife, but I don't want to. Oh speak my god! Cool. Yeah. Well, yes. Okay. It has Mormon origins for it, sure. Yes. Not that there's a problem with that. We are open, but you know, you've spoken about how this book was in some way you tackling things you were uncomfortable with that you were avoiding, which is certainly the place from which I feel like. I make my most successful art. Like when I feel like yeah. I'm walking through sort of mu muddy marshes emotionally. Yeah. I want to know sort of what you mean by that and how does the kind of concept of feeling unsafe or not totally comfortable contribute to your process? Yeah, I can feel that in your work definitely. And I think it's like so juicy. Um, I, how does it feel for me? Yeah, I think when I'm working, obviously I spend a lot of time writing things that I'm comfortable with and looking at them and being like, well, this is a bit boring. And then when you, when you let yourself get into like, I'm going to write a page about like the source of my darkest shame and the thing that I would never want anyone to know about me. And then you're like, well, this has to be published. Like this, this is, this is the good stuff. Yep. Um, I, yeah. I think when I was working on acts of service, I really wanted it to be about even Olivia who's this other woman in their relationship, the, the, the main relationship um, in the book, you know, Lena, because you've read it, but for those who haven't read it, it's between these three people, Eve, who's the narrator, and then this couple who work together, Nathan and Olivia. Um, sort of I wanted the relationship. Olivia. It sort of begins about being about Eve and Olivia since Eve is a queer, yeah. ostensibly queer character. And then Nathan takes the forefront as the kind of antagonist slash romantic lead quite quickly. Yeah, exactly. Like Eve sort of meets them through Olivia, I think, because she has an idea that like she's a gay person. And so like she can meet this woman and like pursue some kind of adventure in that way. And it won't be like opposed to her sense of herself or like her values. Um, but actually, even Olivia just aren't really compatible in, in a way. Like it doesn't even have to do with sexual identity. They're just like it's more that they're similar than that they're interested in each other. Um, and yeah, originally the thing that I was like not ashamed about and thought was really exciting and interesting to write about was how it feels for like two queer women who are supposed to be interested in each other, but like actually aren't to just be looking at each other and being like, oh, you're not doing it the way that I'm doing it. What's better or worse about the way that you're doing it? Like, are you judging me? Is the way that you're doing it the way that I should be doing it? Um, and then it became about something I really didn't want to write about, which is like, the relentless power of heterosexuality to um I don't know, know exert yeah. itself on you but not exert itself on you even in a bad way like that's the problem but to exert itself on you in a way that you're like oh yes i want that well it's almost um, like this kind yeah. of strange like magnetic pull that we are all pulled towards even if of course we, yeah we deactivated it in ourselves and yes. and i think something that was so interesting to me is that there are so many books about sort of like a straight woman suddenly having latent queer desire emerge. But the idea of yes. a woman who identifies as queer from her teenage life suddenly have latent heterosexual desire emerge is this very weird. And what I love is it's like, it's not sexy because I'm doing the wrong thing. It's sexy because I'm doing the right thing, which I told myself was wrong for a long time. So it's super, super layered in the questions it asks. And I get, and about, yeah. how we think about queer desire, straight desire, the social factors that push it all and how it all influences our sex lives. And so I wondered, you know, those are big political questions, but they're also really personal questions. And I wondered how you sort of balanced the personal and the political as you were weeding through and making this, what ultimately is a very like knife-like statement to me. Yeah, it was so hard and I think my ideas about the book like most of all were about like what I wanted to say and all of these not even necessarily political but like theoretical like critical ideas I had about this problem use barking dogs which are the classic <laughs> of modern zoom the embarrassing classic of modern of zoom of course Lady. our friends <laughs> you're saying oh hi um yeah no I I was really interested in the critical and the theoretical first and then I had to and then my first draft of the book was like I got a lot of feedback that it was really didactic you know like 
there was a lot of there were, I think a lot of conversations or scenes where it felt like I was trying to like lay out the political map and then like place the book where it needed to be. And there's still a little bit of that. Like, I think there are moments in the book where Eve is like, okay, here's the landscape that I live in and here's what's antithetical to it about Nathan and Olivia. Like here are my values and the fact that like, I don't want to be someone whose life is about like structuring myself toward what men want. And yet like, here's the scenario in which that's what's being asked of me. Um, I had to like spend a lot of time figuring out how that would come about naturally. Cause of course people do talk about that and it's realistic to have them talk about it, but they talk about it based on like a shared assumption about what our cultural messaging is yeah. rather than like, you don't have a conversation with someone where you're like, well, here's what I was taught by the media when I was a child. Um, and so, it was so <laughs> it's so kind of amazing though because your characters it reminds me of like when Dawson's Creek came out and bear with me and everyone was like these characters are too articulate to be teenagers and then teenagers came out and they were like we're actually very articulate and <laughs> what I love is like your characters are really articulate about their sexuality but I also feel like when I talk to women people of all kinds who are 10 years younger than me that that's actually a reality for them yeah i i think it's funny i think that that's sort of one of the questions in the book where like there's this there's a conversation at one point that the three of them have about like safe words when like they're discussing like how people come into kink scenarios and the scenario that they're in is always very unspoken like no one acknowledges it as a kink scenario which in many ways it's not and like they don't talk about having the safe word like there's there's a real sense that like if they wanted to get out of it who knows how it would go like it would be pretty awkward but to me, that's and also part of what makes it sexy is like there's a for little sure. bit, there's like a layer of unspoken complexity, danger, the possibility that anyone's going to be deeply hurt or slightly scared at any time that appeals to something that was, I mean, when I was in my 20s, nothing turned me on like a big old mess. And that's, that's the thing that like the whole time that that's happening, Eve is like, well, I know it's not supposed to be like this. I know it's supposed to be safe. I know it's supposed to be like condoned. I know it's supposed to be structured. And Nathan, what's so compelling about him is that he's like, no, no. Like, I know the way that it's actually going to be fun. And it's going to be a mess. Kind of like, I've got this, don't worry. And I'm never going to take it too far, but I'm going to take it just far enough, which is what makes yeah, him exactly. such a compelling kind of, yeah. you know, such a compelling anti-hero in a certain way. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so part of the kind of, I feel like part of the politics of the book, and I do think you do a really beautiful job of keeping the book from becoming sort of overtly political in moments where that would mm -hmm. be really easy to do. And mm -hmm. is it sort of breaks down this enduring myth of female sexuality somehow being more complicated, like that there's all different, that we're like not inherently interested in sex, that there are all different things we need in order to feel safe or in order to feel turned on. And Eve is very much a character who has an almost like masculine ability to enter sexual situations and just go like, great, here I am. And of course, yeah. they get more complicated for her. But I mean, something I've thought about a lot on film is like, how do we have female characters who enjoy sex, don't have to apologize for that and aren't yeah. going to be pulled in the end because of the fact that they enjoyed it. And so you have this great yeah. quote that pleasure is crucial to Eve's reckoning with what desire and sex mean in her life and in her culture. And so I wonder how you thought about that and sort of how you also thought about writing a character who well complicated, she talks about, you know, what turned her on in high school, these sort of secret relationships, her dynamic with her dad, it's all, she has her own complexities but her ability to feel desire is not like blunted in that way that we are so used to with damaged female heroines. Yeah. It's funny. I, I think that it's funny to have people talk about Eve as being able to like go into situations with this masculine sexuality where it's like, I'm just going to enjoy this because on the one hand, that's sort of true in the sense that like her relationships with Nathan and Olivia are not like romantic. She's not being like, she's not in a traditional sense being like wined and dined and talking about herself and like no one's convincing her that they really know her and see her and want to get to know her better before they fuck her. Like in a sense, it is 
it is detached and masculine, but also like there's such a emotional and intellectual tension in the relationship that creates her interest in it and like what makes it erotic for her. You know, like I still think, like I think the myth is that it has to be like romance and commitment and true love for women to be down and excited about something. Yeah. And right, the myth, and then like, I mean, I just, I just mean to separate it from like the idea of a masculine sexuality is like, it doesn't matter who the person is. I want, I just want to like get off in this context, oh, right? Like, the idea of a masculine sexuality is like a guy sees two girls, a pair of twins and goes like, wow, I'd love to fuck both of them at once. And exactly. Yeah, and what you created here is actually a very layered sexuality. Like what is fascinating is the way that Eve enters into this is because her personal turn on is to have other people see these sort of detached photographs of her body. And something I related to deeply, which is something I didn't understand about myself until I was much older, is that my main matrix when I was a kid, like a younger person for being attracted to someone was whether they were attracted to me because someone mm -hmm. else being interested in me felt like such an incredibly rare and powerful thing. Yeah. And I think that Eve has some of that, but she also has this unbelievable kind of confidence and bravado about her body where she understands that like most people would be interested in it. It is objectively a beautiful thing. But then it is, it is also still like so compelling, no matter what, in this very bizarre way that's so self-effacing that like you do and Eve does, it does make her interested, the fact that someone else is interested in her. Like that still works on her. I think that is that is part of what makes it feel like so youthful as a story is that I think you do like everyone has that has that reaction when they're younger and then like you do I hope all always age out of it but yeah it's funny like there's that there's a fantasy scene before she meets Nathan in like the first chapter or two where she like this fantasy that she has about the, the thing that sort of seems like I guess male sexuality except it's so feminized is this fantasy that she, fantasy that she has about being lined up with other women and picked out um I, that you know. was a moment when I felt, when I knew that even though I had major sort of like internal differences from this character, that, that just felt like immediate to me, the idea that like, what would make you feel beautiful is to be chosen. The, the anti yeah. antiquated version of it is like a man sees you across a room at a crowded ball and sees you in your gown and goes, I must marry her. The modernized yes. version of it is a guy sees you naked in a lineup and goes, I want that one. Exactly, exactly. But but I think the thing that's that's the most sort of key distinction about it, and I totally agree, is that, you know, she says, I have this fantasy, this guy picks me out, I want to be picked out, but I don't want to fuck him, right? I just want to be picked out, but then I want to have nothing to do with him, it doesn't matter who he is. And I think that's true. Like, it's not just about like, I want to have this experience of sex as an object. It's like when she meets Nathan, and he picks her out in his way, then he does the work of like, compelling her into being excited about him and there so, is a sort of another layer that happens yeah. yeah I think it's so so interesting and there was this amazing you cited this really smart Garth Greenwell quote about sex which I'm going to read in its entirety even though it's too long so please forgive me and I may stutter just because of saying the word sex sex is an experience of intense vulnerability and it is also where we are at our most performative and so it's at once as near to and as far from authenticity as we come Sex throws us profoundly into ourselves, our own sensations, physical and emotional. And it also, at least when it's interesting, is the moment when we're most carefully attuned to the experience of another. And this made me think about the fact that something I always felt, I never felt self-conscious depicting sex, but I always felt self-conscious depicting good sex. Like it was somehow more yeah, yes. and let deeper, people deeper into my subconscious. And again, I was like, is that a millennial thing? I'm scared. Is that a me thing? But what I found so interesting was your the ease with which you wrote good sex in this way that's not overburdened. It's not that kind of like, it's not the kind of like his throbbing member energy of a romance novel. I just, and I wondered whether you found it particularly vulnerable, how you approached those scenes, because they also hold a lot of plot. Yes, totally. I, it's funny. I, I do think that those scenes are of good sex, obviously. And I do think it's harder to write because there's something, it's like irony. There's something about bad sex where it's like, oh, of course it's natural to like be disgusted by this set of things in a sexual scenario, but it's like much harder to admit what's exciting about it. 
um, and have it not be like a throbbing member scenario. Yeah. Um, when I was first showing this novel to some friends, I had a friend who was like, well, the sex scenes are really interesting and good, except that I feel like she always just turns into like frantic jelly when Nathan's around. Like she doesn't have, she doesn't have any structure. She doesn't have any age. It's just on a spine. She doesn't have any, she just is like, this this ball of jelly that's like reaching for things and I was like oh that's the point that's how as soon as she said it I was like that's how you know the sex is good that's how you know that you've gotten to like the actual place that I really wanted to get to which is like she is responsible for putting herself in this situation and she is an agent in that way but she's reached a place at which like she actually doesn't have any control anymore like she's being spoken to at a visceral level that is I, that resonates with me so deeply. And I remember, I mean, in my earliest relationships that were educational to me about sex with some sort of like men who really leaned into the intensity of their masculinity and its power. I remember being like, I entered this room. I don't know how I got here. And <laughs> yeah, I will go back into the world, but I'm here. I guess I just am like a dish rag that's getting flopped around for the rest of my life. <laughs> And that energy is really, that's why this care, why Nathan reminded me of basically every man who had a powerful effect on me throughout my twenties. And also the reasons why I would say things like I'm embarrassed to be straight. Yes. Eve is very embarrassed to be in her case bisexual and it, it's embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's less embarrassing to be like, I love, cause I always say like, I'm like emotional, like I'm like, I love women. I only want to write about women. I only want to paint women. I only want to talk to women. Basically, I just like don't want to have sex with one and I'm not married to one. And I'm embarrassed about that. Cause like if I were really living out my interests, which is like I barely will go to a museum with a painting of a man in it. So why will I marry one? Well, that is what, of course, there's this section early. I completely feel the same way. I feel the same way so hard. And there's that section early in the book where Eve is like, you know, like she says that she talked herself from like a political commitment to feminism into like lesbianism, because that is sort of like, if you, if you like really believe in your values and you really want to manifest your sense of the world and what's valuable and your idea of yourself, like then that's the place that you get to. But then of course, if you're stuck in that place for five years and you're actually attracted to men, there's going to be a rupture. It reminds me how I'm like on a minor level, like I went to like Bennington College for poetry camp in high school and I came back and I'd had this counselor who was like shaving your armpits is like saying yes to the patriarchy. And I was like, that makes so much sense. I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> and then like two years later, I was like, but I actually just don't like having armpit hair. And so like that I'd spent two years oh, exactly being told like, and I was like, well, I obviously want to reflect these values, which I came to poetry camp to express but here's the issue. And I think some of my favorite writing is the writing that she does about her high school sexuality and the relationship that she was in where like at the point of like orgasm, the girl just like the like veil fell away from her eyes and she was like, holy shit, I can't be gay. And that yeah. or whatever, like her orgasm, like shocked her into like rejecting her homosexuality. And that was so powerful to me because especially having been I was always the girl who was like sort of sitting terrified at the, the edge of the room while all my teenage girlfriends made out with each other and it was like very fascinating <laughs> to then watch like who went to college and became like basically like head straight cheerleader who went to then who graduated from college and maybe it was actually gay and then who like went and like married a woman and moved to Boulder Colorado or whatever like how they all bifurcated Yes. Which um, category had the most, had the most participants? I'm going to say that like, like they're like basically all of the girls who hooked up in high school, I'm just going to say it are like straight doctors, which is so wild. Interesting. Because I'm glad they had that time. Me too. So glad. And I would argue that like, I'm probably more queer adjacent than most of them. And just was like much less, it dallied much less in that world. But I will say that most of my best friends from all girls summer camp are gay and that gives me joy so fun if that time gave us anything it was totally an introduction to the dark arts but i just am i'm thrilled but you know i i, and I love the way that she talks about her younger life and the way that she talks about her family and i also love the way that she talks about ambition like something i find very interesting mm -hmm. is like 
she's almost like taken on not being ambitious as like an anti-capitalist position or something. Like it reminds me of a lot of people I know who sort of like frown on being ambitious in an almost political way, but but really it's to conceal like their fear that they may not have anything to do or say. Yes. Yeah, it's it's funny because she is obviously like if you look at the events of the book, I think that in a real sense she is an ambitious character. Like she's an ambitious person. Like she has yeah. big ambitions for like her life and her experience. Like Ooh. she's not trying to like sit at home in a routine oriented life and like see the same people and do the same things every day. Like she has an ambition for change and development and all of these and things but puts, and she puts the events of this story into motion and so like she may work at a coffee shop but she is not content to like be supported by her med school girlfriend and have the same sex every night yeah yeah definitely and she and she is also yeah she's she's making things occur like it's not like Nathan comes up to her on the street and is like I just noticed you and you have to come back to my apartment like yeah. she is the agent of the situation for sure yeah and I think I think what the um, the rejection of ambition is for her which partly has to do with money and capitalism and feeling like when you come from a situation of money like she does there's something like additionally wrong and guilt making about trying to make your own money and imagining that you can like earn something from yourself that you weren't given um but I think the main thing for her is like in order to turn the experience that she's having with Nathan and Olivia into something that is like the the product of ambition, she would have to like make it into art in some way. Like she would have to be able to translate it to other people and make it something that isn't private, which is what Olivia does. By contrast, right, Olivia's a painter and she's using the relationship as a kind of new situation. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that the main, like neither Eve nor Nathan is an artist and they're both in a similar way, sort of like, no, I just want to like, have this experience, benefit from it, change, like take in all of this ambitiously in this way, but it just belongs to me, you know? And other people don't really receive that as ambition because it's not manifesting. It's so interesting to me because also like, like when people would confuse me with my characters and I'd be like, well, if I was like my character, I wouldn't be making this because my characters actually are reflect mm. the part of me that like doesn't have the space to make anything. And it's funny because like if people were to want to kind of compound you and your character in any way, and I don't know if they've tried to like dig into your biography, it's like, well, we can see from the very top, there's like a key difference, which is that you are like taking the world and coalescing it into like this piece of work, which which requires a different kind of discipline and a different approach to your life. Yeah, for sure. Sure, I totally agree. It's really frustrating. I'm, I can imagine how frustrating that was for you for years. And like, yeah, unless you're making art about like a really devoted artist, which would be a very different type of art, right? Because it would be like about a person sitting in a room for, you know, at least three hours a day. Who knows? Can't we wish. Write. At least three hours a day is the dream. You can't <laughs> yeah, write. I wrote for three hours a day today and I feel like a superhero, but um, oh, you, amazing. you can't, it's not every day, girl. But um, you can't, write that also be I say all the time like writing something about a person who has that kind of clear ambition is actually incredibly uninteresting because it involves routine yes. and discipline and can, it's like you don't want to make write about something you don't want to write about someone reading and writing no I mean a lot of people do it but I didn't want to do it either and a lot of yeah and, do I, it, and I usually don't read it I totally understand sometimes I do like to read it but I agree I think you know, even if a piece of art is like coming from like a past period in your life where you weren't so devoted to art and like you were having this messier experience or whatever, like it is, it is very separate in that way because it's really about like intent, an intense period of concern for something other than art. It's, it's really a divide. Which I also think is very youthful, an intense period of concern for something other than like the substance of keeping a life going is so yeah and that's what I think makes this book also feel young to me is like you know I've said before like I joke you know there's been a lot of like discussion of how polyamory allows more room for joy and pleasure and love and attraction and you know that it creates equality and dynamics but 
my fear, like, I'm like, jealousy is what's kept me monogamous. It's that I would have literally no time. Like, that seems so yeah. exhausting. Well, you know, when you actually get into, like, polyamorous communities or discussions at all that aren't just, like, the mainstream being, like, isn't polyamory crazy? It's all scheduling. That's what the whole thing is, is, like, how do we make time for each other and make sure that everyone gets the time that they need. And like, there's this huge, massive, like multifamily calendar. Like that's what polyamory is. It's so fascinating because to me, there's nothing less sexy than a calendar. Like I love it for my life, but it's like, I was talking to someone close to me who's polyamorous and they were like, I'm busy today. I'm actually in my polyamory support group. And it's like when bored housewives think about polyamory they're not imagine they're imagining an escape from a calendar and a support group and And escape from a support group i love that and now what it is is like actually you're right it's this entire lifestyle and the other thing that i realized that i think i can't tell if it's personal or generational is that like this book made me realize that in many ways i consider sex ancillary to life sort of like getting your nails done and that that's not how these characters operate because for them, sex is an activity and it's a form of productivity in and of itself. And so I wonder, like, it's almost like Nathan and is like, I have a job, but my real job is sex. Yeah. The way, the way that Olivia is like, I have a job, but my real job is painting. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, the, it's like the place where I express myself in this like sort of more inarticulable interpersonal way and like make this monument (laughs) exactly and like make this monument and I will be remembered and like that was so fascinating to me because I'm like life happens you work hard to be who you want to be and if there's a little bit of leftover time maybe you have sex and like I looked at this and I was like oh this is cracking open this entire new idea about characters about how the world can operate and I thought you captured that really beautifully you know, there's this Eve Babbitt's quote, there's a couple of them in the book, but late in the book, there's this quote yeah. from her about how, like, you know, for a lot of people, and I think, it, it, you know, for, for a lot of people who are not artists, like, but I think for everyone, like, the the main creative endeavor that they have in their lives is, is a love affair. Like, it's this thing that you pour all of your creative energy into, and you make this monument, and you both remember it. Do you yeah. feel like, like, the rather than sex, which can be ancillary, like the love affair is the central thing that like you pour your creative energy into the way that in the book they pour it into sex. Well, it's interesting you ask that. It's a fascinating question that will make me like do some deep self-examination, but I feel like in my relationship with my (laughs) husband and part of the reason I married him is because he was the first time that I was able to like make a love affair and a relationship like kind of like the central God to which I was devoting myself. And that in my twenties, I was so obsessed with trying to figure out what I was doing artistically, that relationships and then my friendships with women and that relationships took this kind of like way back seat, which I think is one of the reasons that I often dated men who I didn't consider to be particularly good people is because I was like, I'm not going to be particularly good to them. So why would I pick someone who I deeply respected? Because I know that they're going to come eighth in my lineup of things that I'm going to do. And certain relationships yeah. weren't like that, but a lot were. And then when I met my husband, I was like, oh, this is a person where I can see like the life we're making is a project and the yeah. like, trust we're building is a project. But that was really new for me and so I feel like if you'd asked me that a year two years ago I would have been like what are you talking about now I know exactly what it is you're saying and and I love that Eve Babbitt's quote and I mean I'm I I love Eve Babbitt's like crazy totally and everything about her and every time I see a jock around a tree I want to cry with joy for Eve Babbitt's but you know, she in some ways literally hangs over the narrative. She's on an index card above Eve's desk, which is sort of like her desk that you don't quite know what she's doing at. And I wonder, you know, how you think about ACT in terms of its being in conversation with her work. For people who don't know, Eve Babbitt's is an amazing memoirist, essayist who kind of like, like be, captured the zeitgeist of 60s Hollywood and, and relationships and sex then. It was sort of this like famous playgirl, if you will. But I also wonder like, you know, what she did was interesting because again, it was not, it was only political insofar as that it opposed other narratives about women, but it wasn't, there were lots of people in the sixties and seventies who were overtly thinking about and writing about politics in a way that she wasn't. And so I wonder if you think that Eve Babbitts could do what she did now 
and also how you kind of felt like your book was in conversation with what she does of course she could do it now but i think it wouldn't have it wouldn't have well my first answer is it wouldn't have the same weight and it wouldn't feel like so sparkling and unusual but actually maybe that isn't true because plenty of people come to her now for the first time like yeah. her books are reissued a few years ago there was a huge um boom in her readership and excitement about her and and clearly like we do it's not just historical nostalgia or romanticization like we do feel something in it that still feels like really un it's an unusual attitude yeah i think that um yeah her books just embody this attitude about sex and about life that's like inherently so free and like so um I don't know. I mean, it's described as glamorous and it is glamorous, but it's not, it's, it's glamorous in this way that feels very like inviting somehow. Um, I don't it think does. it feels like you're like taking a nap on like a kind of springy, a, a warm spring day. And like, it has yeah. just incredibly like lived in feeling, but I know exactly what you mean. And it's easy to think like, is it nostalgia for a time when people rang each other's bells and didn't have cell phones, but actually it, no. and, and what's interesting is like, I feel as though it's a time capsule, but it's also current. And as yeah. I was reading this story, I felt like this was the kind of book like Fear of Flying or like Eve Babbitt's where it was like, yes. people were going to read it in 30 years and not just go, okay, this is what sex was like in 2022, but are actually going to feel like seen and embraced by it. That is like the best thing a person could hope for, for a book. Thank That's you. I feel like I feel like things, it's one of the reasons I really hate when I have to film a cell phone. It's just because I'm like, timelessness is something that we like work towards and hope for. And I was really yeah. impressed by how you manage technology in it because there is this element of Eve putting her pictures on a message board, texting, but you managed to make it all feel very alive and not like people were sort of mm. like trapped in their digital boxes. Mm. You know, I appreciate that. I did worry about this and I often will write in a kind of timeless, uh, timeless voice where like I'm trying to avoid phones or things like that and people just yeah. go to each other's houses. But I actually think, and I felt, I felt that access service really does feel of its time. Like I felt that I sort of allowed it to. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say, it, but I, I don't think you should feel that there's any sacrifice to filming phones. Like, I think That's it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, of course, it's one thing to write a novel that's entirely about Twitter or Instagram. And like, we have those now and those will feel of their time in a much deeper way, but I think it's unnatural to avoid like the, the, the real daily ways that people communicate. But I really appreciate that it feels timeless too, because to me, almost against my will, it does really feel like a Me Too novel in like a slightly veiled way. And a lot of people have been like, oh, this really feels like 2018. And I'm like, oh yeah, to me, it feels like 2018 in a way. So but I hope that, yeah. Because to me, it feels like a comp, a really like deepening, like, obviously like me too changed our world in the most important ways and then there was also like a fear around asking certain questions because like we weren't necessarily going to be like properly representing women in progress and yeah. i think what you did that's so amazing is like made something that feels politically um that feels like politically like correct and by which i mean like it's the correct politics that i feel like we should all be working towards not pc and also like, like deepens and troubles some of these questions, which I think is a really hard balance to strike and you clearly put in the work to do it. That, I mean, yeah, that's, that's what I most want from a book and definitely what I wanted to do. And it is, it is a bit scary, but very rewarding. Yeah. I'm so glad. Did you, did you feel, well, can I ask you like when you made girls, did you feel that you were attempting the same thing? Would you have described it that way? I think that time, it's funny. I, I like found, there was a quote from me in something that said that I hadn't read because I don't reread things that I said, but when I, you know, in 20, 
2010 or 2011, in which I was like, I don't consider myself a very political person. I'm just making what I'm making. And I think I really believed that for a while. And mm. then the conditions of the world and the response to the work became to politicize for me not to work that in. And that's when I started to kind of do what you described, which is like, lay something out almost like a political argument and then try to find the character in it and the emotion in it. And, but it's, but again, like when people are watching and also in a world that's being increasingly parsed by social media, the way ours are like, it's a vulnerable thing and it's a tight rope. And speaking of which I had like, I think this is a, a you know, a possible um, final question for you, which is that you know, I think that something that I wondered is some a thing I experienced a lot making girls and a thing that I still experience. I just, you know, had a movie at Sundance and experienced the exact same situation. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so I'm much. I'm so excited to see it. I'll send it to I'll send you a secret link. It's got oh a lot God. of please sex. I can't wait to watch it. I mean, like you. the only review I wanted is someone on Letterboxd said this movie's very horny. And I was like, great, we're done. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, that's that's the, best, the best way I can be described. <laughs> Great. Like just like hold me as adjective. Perfect. But um, but so versus as noun. But um, I guess people have so moralized and still do onto female characters who like who betray certain ideals around sex. And you know, this book plays so much with concepts of trust and loyalty. Has anyone kind of, as you've talked to them, taken up a kind of moral shield against Eve as a character because she's cheating on someone because she's involved in this relationship for all the reasons that sort of people love to do that to women specifically? Yeah, it's interesting though. There's a little bit of like, why doesn't, why isn't the central drama in the book more about Eve's infidelity and why isn't she more bent out of shape about cheating on her girlfriend, which I'm like, I'm not saying people shouldn't get bent out of shape about cheating on people, but that's not the focus of the book. And also the book isn't about whether or not she's a good person. That's, that's, it's not relevant. I think that's interesting. Um, but, like we all the time have male characters who are doing interesting things, but aren't particularly good. And it doesn't have to be the focus of the story. Of course. Like I remember but actually, oh, go ahead. Like a book that I love is um, the, like, the miseducation of Nathan the education of Nathaniel P by Adele Waldman because it's like a mm. woman take on like a man kind of making immoral sexual choices in his 20s. And so she sort of like projects onto him some of the questions that we ask of female characters. And that's really interesting. But like mm. yeah, to me, the fact that she's cheating on her girlfriend is really ancillary. It just like provides her some like context for her everyday life. And like, it's not gonna be until she's 39 that she go and they've broken up years before and she feels bad about it, that she's like, maybe I shouldn't have cheated on Romy. Like that's gonna be way in the past. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And the, uh, the other thing which you didn't get at directly in your question, but which I think is one of the most interesting like criticism or pushback that I get about Eve as like a moral character is about like her being a queer character. And I've had a couple people be like, Eve's just straight. Like, why is she kidding herself? Like, why does she have this like, you well, know, like, anxiety about, you, you know, and, 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 and bi like, guys are gay and bi girls are straight. Like the bi guys are gay yeah. and pretending and bi girls are straight and wanting to be interesting, which is like, yeah. And it's like, like, yeah, the, the best sex in the book is definitely the straight sex that she has because the book is about like how she's supposed to deal with how good that is and like her also freak out about it. That she has like a real ease of sexual communication with her long-term girlfriend, but it's, and that their sex was really hot when it started, but now it's been a little while and as happens sometimes. Which is the most natural thing. Yeah. Thing in the world. Yeah. I, that's so wild to me because I never for a second Two things I didn't ask in the book were, what's, is she cheating? She's cheating. Like, what's she going to do about that? And well, is she straight or is she gay? Like, those seem like the least interesting possible questions. I agree. <laughs> but, and it, and I, I agree. very respectfully answered them. But to me, like, I just read it and I was like, well, some person, probably a man in his fifties is going to be like, this lady's a bitch. Or like, uh -huh. you know, like, that's just like the kind of, response I feel like that complicated women who are experiencing sexual desire in a very overt way get 
And I think you do, a, but I also think you do a really great job of guiding us towards what like the most central questions of the book are. I appreciate that. And I just, I want to say again, because we're going to give the, um, the digital audience a chance to ask you questions of which I'm sure they have many, some of which being is Eve straight or gay? Just kidding. Don't ask that question, guys. Um, I just want to say, like, I love this book. I feel so excited to think about what you're writing next and to be in the audience of that, just because I feel like this is an embarrassing phrase, but you're just like a very important new voice. The feeling couldn't be more mutual. I can't wait for your new work. And thank you so much for reading the book and being so thoughtful about it. It's truly an honor and I'm so excited for people to read it and for them to blush. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, Lillian. Uh, I want to I want to uh, make sure everybody knows that they can put a question in the Q&A. We have two questions so far. First one. Um, what is the quality? What is the quality Eve has that uh, that you admire? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Pam, success. Thank you for working out the tech issues and oh. for being my questioner. Um, what is a quality you has that I admire? Um, I think I like that she is quite relentless with herself. You know, like, I think the one of the primary experiences that she has going through the book and that you also have when you're reading it is um Nathan and Olivia saying to her like why are you worrying about the things that you're worrying about why are you pursuing the things that you're pursuing why do you have the anxieties that you have um and she also is sort of asking herself like why am I so uh, caught up in the question of what I want or where it came from or um where it's going to take me or whether I'm going to like what I find when these things in in the year 2022 should be like pretty kosher no matter how you slice it and i i think um i like that she she really cares about those questions it, even even to her detriment i think um that's what i like about her yeah oh that's a great answer so i i, I the question uh here uh the second question is what compelled you to write? Uh, I, we talked about it a little bit earlier um, about how I, I feel what your work compared to. Um, and what compelled you to write about this particular character? And also, were there other authors that, uh, that um, influenced how you wrote about it? Yeah. Um, well, for the first part of the question, I really wanted to write about desire um, and how we can get in touch with it and, and express it when it's so tangled up in so many mixed messages about um, what we should want and who we think we should be. And those are different for everyone, obviously, but like for Eve, in the book, those two poles are, on the one hand, she's come of age in a queer environment. She has this idea about herself and her values and that she's radical in a way and that she's moving beyond the sort of need for male validation um, or to have, you know, male desire be affirming for her. And on the other hand, right, she's been raised in the culture most of us have been have been raised in um a culture that instills us very deeply with the sense that men give us our value and and that it's sexual in nature so i really wanted to find a way to dramatize that problem um and i thought that the relationship with nathan was a juicy way to do it which i think it did turn out to be um and you pam so sweetly made a comparison when we were talking earlier that 
I haven't heard before that you thought the book reminded you a little bit of Omni Snin. Um, Absolutely, totally did. Which I love, which I love. And in fact, I don't think it was particularly strong in my mind when I was working on Acts of Service because I think that Nin, I was thinking a lot about structure and how to craft the the plot of the narrative because that that was the part that was hardest for me and the writing came pretty naturally and Nin's writing feels so diaristic. With the, my favorite parts of it are our actual diary and so um I wasn't I didn't have her in mind as much but I do think she has that quality of like relentlessness with herself and also she has such a deep allegiance to privacy and like the personal um and to like herself and her privacy even in relationship to people she's intimate with I think that you have some of that energy as well I think Eve also has what Anna Eastman has with her characters is like there's a certain like I I don't why should I feel guilty about this I'm exploring who I am and that's just the way it is I, this is this seems really right to me and I'm going to push it as far as I can go whatever what what feels good to me and exploratory yeah which reminded yeah, me sure. so much of your work like yeah, I'm going Thank to explore you. this. This is a, and also both, both of both you and Anna East just has this really great prose. I so agree with Lena Dunham that your prose is just special. Thank so, you so much. Um, I have a couple of more questions, but we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, what was the process like for getting your debut published? Yes. Yeah, so um, pretty quickly, I did an MFA. I, I did it at NYU, and that was definitely the way that it happened for me. And I think it's one of the easiest ways, or I mean, easiest isn't the way, but I, I think uh, one of the benefits to getting an MFA, and there are some downsides as well, um, is that it puts you in touch with a lot of the people who can help you get published. Um, one of my professors introduced me to my agent, Dan, who's out here somewhere tonight. Um, who has been an amazing champion for me and managed to find a publisher for my book quite easily. Um, I don't, I know that many people go about finding an agent without having gotten an MFA or gone to school for writing, um, but that was how I did it. And then just one more real quick one. Um, what's your process for creating a character, especially when they're completely different from your headspace? It's really hard, and I don't think I could create a character that was completely different from my headspace. Like, I think you can create a character who is really different from you or the way that you would behave in a given situation, but they have to be, like, emerging from where, where your head is at about a particular problem. Like, if I weren't thinking about the problems that you've is thinking about and like encountering situations that make me worry about the situations that he's going to encounter. I, I don't think I would have written acts of service. Um, but at the same time, of course, you can take that headspace and and try and move move it into like a different a course of action that you invent that's sort of going to allow you to dramatize the thoughts that you're having about it. But it's really, I mean, it's really, really, really hard. There are so many um, approaches that people tout for it. But I think mine is just to write a lot, like so much more that ends up in the book and hope that an enormous volume of material will like show me what, what it wants to be. Yeah. You're working on something now? very slowly I, I am yes it, um it's not i wouldn't even say it's a book yet but i have a headspace and i'm channeling it now <laughs> well i can't wait i can't wait you're i i think you're going to be a, as i agree with lena that your voice is is going to be special and important thank you so much so i really I appreciate that so to, much i really look forward to your career i look forward to selling this book Please, everybody, buy this book from University Bookstore or your nearest uh, independent bookstore. Uh, thank you so much, Lillian. What a great um, 
conversation. Thank you so much for answering questions. Um, good luck with everything. You deserve, you deserve it all. <laughs> Thank you all for putting on the event at the bookstore. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, we're, for, we're at the end of our time. Uh, and we just thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the link for uh, buying the book is in uh, the chat. And we hope to see you again at um, another of our events at U Bookstore. Thanks all. Thank you.